Hey, welcome everybody to Bacon and Coffee this Saturday morning. I have an incredible guest as usual. He is the man, the myth, the legend, Jeff Herring. And I missed him because, man, he hasn't been around. It's been like eight weeks since I talked to him. But anyways, before we get started, I'm going to do our 30-second countdown. And welcome everybody to Bacon and Coffee. It would not be Bacon and Coffee if we did not do our initial pork and caffeine theme song. Here we go. All right, welcome everybody, and glad you could make it this morning. Feel free to jump in the comments and give us some chat. Hey, Jeff, glad you could join us. So, uh, I'm happy to be here. It is fabulous, man. It is so cool that you can come join us again. How's uh, how's being a grandpa? How is that? So it fun. is one of the, if not the best. You know, it's second only to having kids. You know, hmm. yeah. Um, and it is. Uh, did, did I tell you the story about the? what they were going to call me? No. Okay. So this is, this is funny. It tells you how slow I can be sometimes. <laughs> um, for months before Bodie was born, John and Caroline are asking, what do you want him to call you? And, you know, I called my grandfather Gangi because I couldn't say grandfather. Mm -hmm. John, my son called his grandfather Bampy because he couldn't say grandfather. And so there's a tradition of, you know, whatever the kid comes up with, what, right? So my only answer was, you know, let him decide, right? Let him decide. Mm -hmm. And uh, about the third time I was over there after he was born, they asked again. It finally hit me. Oh, he's got to have something to start with. Right. <laughs> he's not just going to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they've got to start somewhere. So, yeah, you sit there and say, Grandpa, Grandpa, Grandpa. You know, it's mom, little, mama, little mama, little mama, mama. How, how's this one fit? Um, uh, we're starting with Poppy. I like Poppy. Yeah. I yeah. Like Poppy. Yeah, because you're kind of like uh, Popeye, the sailor man, you know? That's right. <laughs> Strong to the finish. <laughs> That's right, because you eat your spinach. <laughs> so, all right, man. Well, it is so good to have you back. This hour always goes so quick. So I want to dive. Yeah, it does, because there's so much that we can talk about. And... You know, so for those of you in the audience, uh, Jeff Waltzma says, hi, Jeff. It's the Jeff show, Jeff and Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Uh, um, and uh, Jeff's a woodworker. It's what he does. He's, he's a cool dude. And uh, anybody else, if you have any comments or thoughts or questions, put them in the uh, chat window, especially on LinkedIn. I will be looking at Facebook if I can. It's always tough to look at multiple platforms. But I want to I, I start this off because I've been going down this path of I'm trying to figure out how do we better connect with people? I'm working on a, a presentation right now that is, it's been a lifelong dream. And I wanted, I've always wanted to do a TED talk and I've failed every single time because I couldn't come up with something. The whole concept of a TED talk is how do you change the world? That's really what it's about. You know, what idea do you have that changes the world? And my ideas were never unique, but then I came up with this one concept and it, it's it, the the title doesn't do the concept biz, uh, um, justice, and the title is is profitable relationships: how to transform your CRM into an ATM. And and the concept is is title, pal. Thank you. No, it, it it ranked very high on the headline creator tool. Um, but the key thing is is really what it's talking about is relationship building. Right. And how to use the current relationships that you have to basically fulfill what it is that you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to achieve going to an ATM and getting money out of it, that's one thing. If you're trying to achieve change in the world, that's another thing. But it still boils down to how do relationships, you know, correlate to what you do? So here's the question I've got to start off with you. What the heck do we want content to do? I love it. Since one of my brands is content does. Mm hmm. That kind of fits. 
Uh, make connection for four things. Okay. Right? Make connections, build relationships, make a difference, and make a profit. Say that again. Okay. I hope I can remember it because I just made up two of them. <laughs> <laughs> I love this on the fly stuff. <laughs> make a connection, mm -hmm. build a relationship, make a difference, and make a profit. Mm -hmm. I love it. I absolutely love it. And that that is essentially, that's what this is all about. So going down... You know, going down the rabbit hole, one of the things that I've started to study is, you know, the, the, I'm trying to get into the psychology of communications. And I know you're the perfect person to talk about that. That's why I'm so excited to do this. And can you hear me? I can. Loud okay. and clear. And you right. I can hear you, but I think my computer just locked up again. So what I'm going to do is I am going to let you go for a second and I'm going to have to reboot and come back. This has happened before. Just every once in a while, my computer freezes. I don't know why I even restarted. No we got a lot of technology working here. Yep. So I'm going to, let's see, I cannot, uh, I can't do anything. So I'm just going to let you talk. I'm going to go away, but keep going. Okay. You mean so I'm going to have to wing it for a few minutes? You're going to have to wing it for a few minutes. But the question I want to ask you is talk about the psychology of content talk about where how you got into that and why it's important I love that question Brian and for those of you that don't know I'm a recovering counseling psychologist I was in private practice for about 27 years and and then traded my couch for a mouse is the short way of saying that um, more explanation is I started writing a relationship column for the local newspaper okay and what I found because people have done it before me, but they wrote really exciting stuff like what is depression or what is bipolar or whatever. And so all I wrote about was what I was seeing in my office, both the problems and the solutions. And here's what I discovered. Here's, here's a takeaway for you about the psychology of content. If you can demonstrate to folks, and it can be in a, in a video or a, you know a live cast like this, podcast, webinar, article, blog post, column, whatever. If you can demonstrate two things, the unique way you approach problems, and the second thing is the unique way you solve problems, you're going to build a following without any effort or much effort. You're going to build people that are committed to listening to you, and you're going to do those four things we just talked about. Make a connection, build a relationship, make a difference and make a profit because think about it. Um, do you feel connected with any commercial you've ever been blasted with from your TV? No, of course not. Okay. Do you feel connected? Those of you that are regular listeners, Jeff, for instance, uh, do you feel connected to Brian? Give us a yay or nay in the Q and a, and more than likely you two have never met. Okay. But there is a relationship. There is a connection established. Now, one of the funny stories around that, um, just about every time I go to speak at a conference or even attend one, um, one of the first questions I get when I meet people that I've you know done these kind of things with, one of the first statements I get is, wow, I thought you'd be taller. And, and that just that blew me away for a while until finally I came up with an answer to that. So now when someone says, you know, I thought you'd be taller, I answer with, yeah, so did I. And, you know, I got up here to 5'10 and stopped. So I, I'm with you on that. Okay. So what you do with your content is you demonstrate your unique way of approaching problems, your unique way of solving problems. And that establishes the connection, builds a relationship, makes a difference and makes a profit. Absolutely. And that, that is so spot on. But I think that a lot of people skip a few of those steps. Yep. And I, I think what happens is, and, and there's a big difference, and, and, and going back to what I was talking about before, I think that there's, a, um, there's some deep-rooted things inside of who we are, what we do, and why we exist. I mean, there's there's... The and I was listening to a radio station while I was getting ready for this, and, and somebody was talking about the two brains that we have. We have the survival brain, then we have the, you know, basically the um, the the 
the brain, it's the social brain. So we have the survival brain and the social brain. And digging right. back into um, some of the basic things, there's one thing that I've learned over the course of the years. And this is, this is a, a funny and true story. I was giving a speech for uh, Washington State University or Was uh, Central Washington University. And I was, I was teaching a bunch of kids about social media. And one of the kids stands up in the middle of the presentation, asked me a question, says, have you heard about Dunbar's number? What do you think about it? And I had no idea what Dunbar's number was. And so I said, well, tell me what it is, because I have no idea. You know, I can admit when I'm wrong. You know, I know <laughs> it's something new. You know, that's the beauty. Yeah, of doing how it. yeah, it's how we learn. So I said, I have no idea. And they said that Dunbar is an anthropologist who says that the average human can know about 150 people. They can maintain a relationship with 150 people. Now, I initially poo-pooed that idea. I said, well, you know, I've got 3,000 people I'm friends with on Facebook. I got 3,000 people I'm friends with on LinkedIn. I can maintain those, you know, 6,000. Right. I have about 10,000 people that follow me, which isn't a huge number, but it's, you know, it's respectable. And so, you know, I was all into, you know, no, I can, I can handle 10,000 people. I don't know what you're talking about. But as I started digging deeper and deeper and deeper into this, what I found out is that the human brain can actually maintain a real relationship, meaning a, a, a coexisting, we help each other kind of relationship with about 150 people. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between creating content to become an influencer and creating content for your tribe. Would you agree with that statement? Ooh, that's, that, let's deep. unpack that because that's awful deep. Yeah, and that's the point. It's between content to become an influencer, whatever the heck that is, um, and content to what was the last part? Well, it's content to for your tribe, your tribe of 150 yeah. people. And I'll talk about that a little yeah. deeper too. Go ahead. Content to make a difference, content to help people change. Mm -hmm. Okay, I like that. I like that. So you know, it's what you're, what, part of what you're talking about. Remember the old, you know, concentric circle stuff, right? You know, and and you know the people that are close to you, the people that are further out, etc. What what you what you remind me of though is another thing I find interesting about the human brain, and that's how much information we can retain mm -hmm. at one time. Like for instance, Brian, what's your childhood phone number? I have no idea. Really, you don't. You know, it's, that's not still there. No, it's not still there. I remember the 696 Cypress Street. I remember that, the yeah, address. All right, all right. But, you know, and and um, cell phones have kind of messed this up. Right. But, you know, a lot of people, um, a lot of people remember those numbers and can give you a phone number, okay? And you mm -hmm. can, we can retain plus or minus seven pieces of information, right? Mm -hmm. Well, how many numbers are in a phone number, Right. You know, right. the, the three yes. and then the, the four. We got seven. Now, here in the Atlanta area, when there's like five area codes, I mean, I could be calling the person next door and it's a different area code. Um, you know, it kind of messes things up. But I, I, I think I think those places in the brain are, are related in that how, how many people can we maintain a life altering, if you will, relationship mm -hmm. um, versus you know, somebody you can nod at on the street. Yeah, and that makes sense. And a couple of um, comments here. Doreen says, hi, Brian and Jeff. And Doreen hi, was a guest a couple of weeks ago. And Andrew said, I think he's talking about the the um, uh, difference between influencers and tribes. He says, uh, relevant versus empty platitudes, which I think kind of makes sense. You know, it's, you know, relevant. Now, now one of the things that I think that we have to look at from here and, and getting back to what you were talking about. What did you say that influencers and what? Uh, well, it's influencers versus your tribe. Tribe. Okay. All right. And so, um, and so let's go back to the 150. And this is, I, again, I've been listening to these books on Blinkist. Blinkist is like the coolest thing in the world because you start off with one topic. So you can pick the brain and it goes from the brain and talks about the different segments of the brain. Then it goes on to relational, what the brain is. And one of the things that they talk about is the survival versus the social. 
And and there's so there's so much deep stuff to unpack here. We could go off on tangents, and I'm trying to keep it focused. But the key thing is, is that the you know the the survival thing is one of the reasons why we had a pack of 150, is right. because when and and there's been studies on this, and and it goes back to um, even primates, you know, pre-human, where um, when tribes got too big, they would turn into a power struggle. Or, you know, those kind of things. So you, you learned how to recognize up to 150 faces. And then out of those 150 people, people had different, you know, um, uh, levels that you thought of them. There were the hunters and the gatherers. There were the people that prepared the food, people that made the fire, people that ruled and created rules, you know. So there, there are all these different things. So you have different re relevant um, concepts for each one of these people. And, and so within that 150, we can recognize them, we know them. And if we see somebody, and this goes back to something very interesting, which I think is, is kind of core, and we'll jump back to the content part of this and why it's important. Well, but one, I think. Say what? I think we're still on the content. Part. Well, we are, we are. But the, the, the key thing that I found was that, um, you know, when somebody comes in that you don't know into the tribe, you immediately have this fight or flight thing going on. All right. And I think it's the same thing when we're out networking. When we first meet somebody, you know, the first thing is, is like, is this person a good person? Is this somebody here who's going to help me? Is this somebody who's going to take advantage of me? Is this yeah. somebody who's going to kill me? I mean, yeah. So if we know the person and we already have a relationship with them that know, like, and trust, we have a different set of uh, endorphins, a different set of um, things that come to us. But when it's somebody that we don't know, it's very different. So, you know, when we're doing content, I think, you know, I've always talked about the tree of content and the tree of content is, is the open concept. What I talk about is, uh, you know, it's oblivious, pondering, engaged in need. Oblivious, nobody cares about it. Pondering, I'm thinking about doing something. Engaged is I need to learn about something and need is I need it right now. I always talk about dog food with this because I, you know, you got dogs, I got dogs, you know. Yep. Um, and so you're a good person. Right. So oblivious is what a lot of people do from the influencer standpoint. They don't care. Right. They just want to get the message out there. All right. Right. And they think that everybody is a customer, meaning that somebody who has a cat might be a customer because they have pets, which is, you know, crazy cat ladies don't buy dog food. No matter how much you tell them about it, it doesn't matter. And um, at, at the risk of being disagreed with, which would be OK, in general, which again is always dangerous to speak in. <laughs> now, having said all that, in my experience, those are two very different kinds of people. Yes. Cat folks and dog folks. Yes, they are. They are. Um, and, and you know, that's, that's okay. You know, dog yeah, people. I had both. Yeah. I mean, I don't walk, I've never, I tried walking a cat once. It did not work out well. <laughs> well, I took a job in South Florida after I got my master's at FSU mm -hmm. and the, the, the apartment building I lived in, that was the rule. To have your cat outside, it had to be on a leash. And that was the weirdest thing. Yeah. And, and I try, I've i actually tried it. I've tried putting my cat on a leash. I did uh, too. And the, oh, it didn't the work well. The grumpiest neighbor about that particular rule, um, when I when I moved there, because I, 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 I tell people I spent a year there one summer. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was not fun. Um, this is kind of bad, but... I'll admit it. Uh, when I moved there, I hung my leash on the guy's doorknob. I'm like, really? Bye. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. It's funny. Yeah. So, but then, so you got oblivious. They don't care. All right. But influencers right. are just getting out there. They don't care who gets it. They just want to try to, you know, find some people. Then we get to the pondering side of thing. O P E N. Pondering is, you know, we're thinking about getting a dog. They don't care about whether you have you know, dry food, wet food, kibble, you know, natural, grain-free, all of this other stuff. All they need to know is that you have dog food. So part of the content process with there is awareness, right? It's just saying we make dog food and they need to pay attention to this. Then we get to the engaged side of things where we are going to get a dog and we need to start learning about what kind of food to feed this thing. Okay, so now I want to know the difference between grain-free and and not grain-free and dry food and wet food and, and raw food and, you know, all. what's the difference between old Roy and Nutro? You know, what, what I need to figure out what I want to feed my dog based on my belief system, right? And so people are going to research that. That's when they're getting ready to buy and that's the engaged side of things. So there's where we create... The kind of content that you're just you know a master at and the stuff that you do on medium and all the other things you know so you're doing things to kind of get people educated 
And the last one is need. Need is where people have, they have a dog in the car. If they don't feed it, it's going to die. So then they go find an expert and they take it to the pet food store, you know, or, you know, they make a bad decision and go to Walmart and buy old Roy, um, <laughs> you know, because it's cheap, right? Yeah. It's kind of like the McDonald's of dog food. Exactly. But, you know, so, but if somebody really cares and wants to do something, they're going to engage with need at that point. And not only can you, when they are ready to make that decision, you're walking in and saying, okay, what do I feed this thing? And the, you know, the lady at the store looks at a man at the store and looks at it and says, okay, it's not a great Dane. It's a Chihuahua. You need this, yeah. you know, because how much do I feed it? You know, what kind of food, you know, what does it need? What is it's, right. um, you know, all this kind of things. I love and this so, technology. Yeah, thank you. And then, then when you get down to the, the you know the brass tacks, when they buy the dog food, it's like, do you have a dog bowl? Do you have a cage? Do you have a leash? Do you have a harness? <laughs> you know, do you have toys? Do you have all? And and so when somebody's in that mode, you know, and they're buy and they're desperate at that point, then they're open to just you know th they'll they'll make decisions based on what they're going to afford, but they'll actually buy more when you get them to that point. So there's this process of getting them, you know, making them aware and basically educating them or entertaining them and then getting them to the point where they actually make the purchase. So when it comes to a tribe, you know, we're not looking for what the influencers, a thousand, a million, a hundred thousand, you were talking about email lists, you know, you got 3000 people on email lists and, and, you know, people don't open it because they're not in any one of those spots. They right. were at one time they signed up. Right. right. So with content, you know, how do you feel that, you know, that kind of principle plays into things and, and do you work within that progression? I mean, do you talk about how to create, you know, awareness graphics and educational stuff and, you know, sales letters all combined? The, the answer is yes. And I'm going to do it more based on this kind of, this is why I love coming on your show. Mm -hmm. I never know where we're going to go. Of course. But it's always somewhere cool. Okay. So let, let me answer that with some stories. Please. And, and these are going to be stories from back in the, the private practice days when I started writing that call mm -hmm. and everybody, please hear this. Every offline strategy I share in the next few minutes is 10,000 times more powerful online. Okay. But, but Brian, I, you know, I started writing it in 94, which is all hilarious by itself because I never finished my PhD um, because my professors told me I couldn't write. And I believe him. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this column all of a sudden and Again, like I mentioned earlier, I, you know, people saw how I approach problems in a unique way and the unique way I solved problems. And in a town, Tallahassee, Florida, full of therapists, I became the guy in the paper. Okay, and um, if you know, if we if I'd have thought about it back then, I'd, I'd, I'd go get the domain name, right? Um, so, <laughs> uh, and when I first noticed it, was therapist colleagues were telling me that they were having clients coming in with my column cut out of the newspaper saying, I want to talk about this. Like, whoa, okay. And then there was the being recognized, you know, you know, around town and that kind of stuff. But the day that blew me away, okay, a bunch of us are on one of the shuttles from the civic center to um, the stadium to watch an FSU game. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're packing and stuff. And some of the people I was with was talking to this one woman and this is what I heard her say. She asked, is that the, is that the guy in the paper? And they said, yeah, Do you read his column. And she goes, yeah, I live my life by, by his column. Wow. And the people looked at me and I just, I dropped my head <laughs> and they thought I was upset or mad or what I was praying. Hmm. Because the weight of that hit me. Holy crap. This is not just something I throw together once a week, right? Um, you, a lot of times you'll never know the difference you're making in someone's life. And you can make a difference without ever talking to the person, without ever meeting the person. Mm -hmm. But there's greater differences, okay? So inside that circle were the clients I had in my office, Okay. And so having content in the paper every day and then on the radio and then on TV, right? Um, translated to online, that's articles, podcasts, and live casts like this. Um, that was more of an inner circle. These were people that were trusting me with their hearts, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's where I, where I had the most influence 
And then on the, the outer circles, you know, more and more at a different level. Um, so all of that to say, folks, you want to make a difference, create content. Okay. Mm -hmm. You got to write that one down, right? I like that. Yeah. Want to make a business, <laughs> create, con create content because people are paying attention. Okay. Um, another story about that. I belonged to a campus ministry at FSU back um, way before the turn of the century in the 80s, you know, in the mm -hmm. century. Um, and they had a, a, a thing called Encounter every Tuesday night, and somebody spoke and did something. And after I'd finished my master's and was working, they asked me to come back and speak at an encounter one night. I'm like, okay, cool. Never really done it like this before, but I'll do it. And so I put together some some music I wanted to play and talk from it and everything. But I mean, it was one of the first times, Brian, and I was a nervous wreck. You know how you get like sweaty and your upper lip is wet. And oh, yeah. You get that little white stuff on your lips. And you're, uh, I mean, it was probably the most horrible presentation I ever made in my life. Okay. So a couple of years later, that same group goes on a ski trip and asked me, a buddy of mine called me up and said, we want you to speak at, on the ski trip. Okay. We'll pay your way, pay your food, pay your lodging, buy your lift tickets, buy, you know, buy your rental skis and you get a fee. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, let me check my calendar and move everything I need to, to do this. Right. So we're driving up there and I, I've never told this story without getting choked up. So get ready. Um, we're driving up there from Tallahassee to, to North Carolina and pull over somewhere to get gas. And, um, couple of the girls in the group walk up to talk while I'm pumping gas and it's like 30 out and they have on sandals. It's like, you've really not done this before. Have you? Um, but they say, see that guy over there? I say, yeah. What about him? He goes, you remember that talk you did at, at the campus finish? I went, yeah, I'm trying to forget it, but I remember it. Why? He goes, he said, he just told us he was there that night and he came to the, to the campus ministry meeting with the intention of going back to his dorm and committing suicide. Wow. And something you said made him change his mind. And I thought, oh, my goodness. I mean, I'm, I, I'd expect to hear it. Listen to that talk made them want to go do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but that that rocked my world. You know, um, a quote I used this week. Um, you and I have talked about Bob Goff before. Yep. Really mm -hmm. interesting gentleman. Um, but he said, um, God's words create life. Our words shape life, mm -hmm. and that's so true. And and as I mean, this is we didn't have a title for this, but it's now called the psychology of content. Um, we're talking about powerful stuff here, mm -hmm. life altering stuff, career altering stuff, and you know, you I, I, now I'm thinking now that I'm a grandfather for all of three months. Um, or 12, if you count the nine months he was cooking. <laughs> bacon. <laughs> yeah, that's right, bacon. Side note, uh, my son, Caleb, my youngest son, and I look a lot alike. Okay? Mm -hmm. All he needs is white hair and a goatee. Um, and the first time I saw Bodie, John had called me up the night he was born, did a FaceTime so I could meet him, right? And I thought, he looks so much like Caleb. And, and I thought, okay, I'm not the one to say that. Let them figure that out. So that he was born on a Thursday night, apparently Friday night, Caroline was talking to her mom on the phone and she said, mom, I worked so hard for nine months and cloned Caleb. <laughs> <laughs> so all that to say, um, I'm thinking more about generations and legacy here, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and I think there's a generational impact of what we put out there, you yeah. know? and a legacy comp component of what we put out there. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't mean folks. Now you guys know me as the, I make things as simple as possible. We don't do hard here. Excuse me. Um, so don't take this and go, Oh, I've got to spend a year writing this next article. No, you, you, you do a lot of them to get good at it. And, and believe me, the ones that I thought were the best, Sometimes are the ones that tank and the ones that I thought were garbage, the ones people going that changed my life. I'm like, really? Um, so, but I, I think what we're talking about here, whether it's a Ted talk, whether it's a live cast like this, 
or an article in your blog, this is life changing stuff for people who need it in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, the key thing, I mean, one of the things that you say, just create content, just create content, just create content, you know, and, and I agree 100%. And I think that there is, you know, there's value in it for somebody. There always is. There's going to be. And but the thing I'm, I'm trying to get my arms around with this is, you know, the how do you find or how do you continue to communicate with that guy at the gas station? You know, or can you, you know, because those are the people that is, you know, he, he's kind of on the outer circle of your tribe, but he really is in your tribe because you changed his life, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one, one of the goals of evangelism is to get people to spread the message, you know, what you're hoping for in the concept of content. Um, there is, you're going to either, and again, we're going to go backwards. To this is people in need. They actually act on what you're asking for. Okay. Right. The people who are engaged, they're the ones that actually repeat what you say, but they don't necessarily act on it. Right. The people with that are pondering will pay attention to what you have to say, but they won't necessarily repeat it or, you know, do anything with it. And the oblivious people could care less. Right. So when you sit and you look at it, you know, creating content, I think that in order for us to make a difference, we've got to start to identify how do we communicate with the people who are within that inner circle or, you know, the 150 is what I always say. And, and the reason I'm, I'm, you know, I said at the beginning of this that, you know, the 150 people, um, I, I poo pooed it at first, but then I started to understand the dynamic behind this. Right. And the other thing about it is we spend 60% of our time with about the top five people within that 150. And, and, and there's some other, there's a ton of science around this that make a lot of sense. And again, through these books I've been listening to, are you familiar with the company Gore-Tex? Say again? Gore-Tex, G-O-R-T-E-X. Yes, yes. Okay. So Gore-Tex has a philosophy and they figured out that 150 is the perfect size for team, for engagement, for productivity and innovation. And the way they figured out this is they basically built different plants with different sizes. And what they found is the ones that had 150 people or less were the ones that were most productive and giving them the biggest value. So what they did is they tried an experiment and they built a plant and they put in 150 parking spaces. And as soon as the parking lot filled up and people started uh, parking on the lawn, they built another plant. And they started noticing that those plants were giving them the highest level of productivity. Mm -hmm. You know, so so the key question is, how do we you know, how do we get our message uh, and how do we identify those people that are actually acting upon it? I guess. So how do we create that feedback mechanism? Such great questions. I'm going to answer that one. But mm -hmm. you just triggered something for me about profit. Please do talk about later. So remind me. OK, um, I think part of the answer, Brian, is availability. And, and by that, I mean. You know me, I tell, I, I make points and stories. I used to run an adolescent drug treatment center in uh, mm -hmm. Tallahassee. And I mean, our first building was a 1940s building with no, no insulation, no electricity and a fireplace in the group room. I mean, the, the first year there, we could either get paid or um, turn on the heat. Um, one of my first jobs when I got there each morning was to go to, in the winter, was to go to the kitchen, get an ice pick and pick out the ice from the two bathroom toilets Mm -hmm. you know, people could use them. I'm thinking we got to go up from here. Um, hmm. And, you know, I thought I'd be there for a few years and then, then move on, which I did into private practice, but probably 30 people in my Facebook friend circle are those kids grown up. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way for them to maintain that relationship maintain that avail availability. Now, does that mean you're available 24 seven? Oh, heck no. That's unhealthy. I mean, like Bob Goff, we just talked about um, at the back of every one of his books, he's got his phone number mm -hmm. and he picks up and we'll talk with you. Um, I don't know that I'll ever get there, um, but I think it's about availability. And another, an see, one of the things about content is that it's evergreen. Mm -hmm. right? I have not written that weekly relationship column for the Tallahassee paper since summer of 04. Okay. So what okay. is that? 17 years now? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, do you know, I still get referrals from that column. Sure. People have kept it. People have kept it in their briefcase under their pillow on their 
you know, their bulletin board or whatever. And what happened because of content, folks, um, I got this. I got this a lot of times when people called me up for an appointment. I never thought I'd need someone like you. But now that I do, you're the first one I thought of. Hmm. Folks, write that down because that's the advantage of getting content out there. Okay, When people need someone like you, you're going to be the first one they think of. Okay, And so I don't, I don't do, you know, that kind of counseling practice anymore, but I do do. <laughs> he said, do do. Yeah, he said, do do. <laughs> <laughs> This is one of the things I love about you. You can get so serious and then do that. Um, of course. <laughs> um, is I do do some coaching from that. You know, mm-hmm. you're willing to do it with Zoom or online or whatever. And so I think being available to people in whatever way works for you right now makes that difference. Now, the, the profit piece of that, you're talking about 150 people. So I started thinking about a membership site mm-hmm. with 150 people in it. Okay. Right. So using easy math, if it was a dollar a month at 150 people, that's 150 bucks. Okay? Right. 10 bucks a month, you've now got $1,500. Right. A month. Okay. Um, is that right? No, no, 10 yeah. bucks. You got 100. Yeah, yeah, you got 15, right. Yeah. I'm math. You know. No, I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. Saturday morning and math do not go well with me, but right. you were right. I was actually, you know, processing. So. Okay. So, so what do you have if you, if you have, if you're charging a hundred bucks, what would that be? 15,000? 15,000, right. Well, okay. What if you had a thousand people? Well, if you charge, a, if you had 150 people and you charge them a thousand bucks, you'd have $150,000. A month. Right. Okay. See how this, I mean, this is not just deep thoughts, folks, about content. and connect. Right. There, there's a profit side to this that, um, like, um, do you know Paul Evans? Yeah, on, of course. He's okay, the other right. bacon brother. He's a bacon brother from another mother. <laughs> exactly. <right. laughs> and he, he's got some great stories, but um, he, you know, one of the things he does is he supplies curriculum for youth ministers. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it's $10 a month, but he's got 3000 members. Right. So before he does anything else every month, he's 30 K up. Right. Okay. You know, th- this, this is a good way to do things. So right. to me, to me, what lights me up, what gets me up in the morning and, and with a grin on my face and whistling is I get to make a difference and a profit with mm-hmm. what working from this little desk in a loft at home, you know, and then working with my inner circle of clients, I get to help them go do the same thing mm-hmm. with their people. And I, you know, it's a pretty gratifying way to live. It's, it's an incredible way to live because you know, you're making a difference, and, yeah. you know, and you're, you know, and people, I, I've always heard this. I think it was Kathy Demers who taught me this. Matter of fact, I was on a call with her. She's a uh, um, sales coach out of yep, Canada. Exactly. And I think she was the one who told me that, you know, she held up a dollar and says, what is this? And I said, well, it's a dollar bill. She goes, no, it's a certificate of appreciation. The more you do that people love, they give you more of these certificates. And when you look at money that way, it completely changes the way that you focus on stuff. So if you're creating content for the cert, you know, cert certificates of appreciation, then it doesn't become this, you know, am I greedy? Am I that, you know, you, it takes away some of the mental constraints or the mindset issues that we put in there. So going back to what you were saying about, you know, the, the generational influence about, you know, there's, this is so deep. And again, you know, we're, 39 minutes. We literally have 20 minutes. We're two thirds of the way through this and we barely scratched the surface. But I think the the thing that is kind of important in all of this is when you go back to the original tribes, you had two people that were just so interdependent upon each other. And those were the people that would make the tools, okay? The people that would figure out how to make the flint to make the fire, the people that would take the rock and turn it into an arrow, right? And then you had the other people that were interdependent in the face, you know, if you had the arrow, you had to go hunt, right? And so then you had the hunters, the people that were fast enough and smart enough to track down food. You know, maybe the guy making the arrow wasn't fast enough to catch the food, but they would make it with understanding of who they were making it for, right? And right. so n- now you got two uh, codependency there. And then the people that catch the food, you got the guy who's making the flint, making the fire, but there's somebody else at the fire who is um, 
sitting there actually learning how to cook the food, you know, and, and actually taking away the bacteria that made us healthy and, and you know, formulated who we are today that helped us evolve. Right. You right. know, so you, you look at all those codependencies and, and the way that things work. And one of the things that I found since, and you mentioned 2004, which immediately sparked this whole thought, is that was when I first jumped on LinkedIn. Wow. 2000, I've been on this for 17 years. I was one of the wow. first thousand people on there. You know, I jumped wow. on um, Facebook, I think it was 2008, like about four years after it started. And so I've been playing with all these things. And over all this time, I've been looking at the tools as a methodology. And I think that's one of the places where a lot of people get kind of cranked up. Because back mm -hmm. to your story, when you were talking about creating content back then and people still pay attention to it, back when I owned my recording studio, I was doing content marketing in 19, or excuse me, 1979 is when I was doing content marketing. Wow. And I've told you this story before on, yeah. on webinars and things like that is, you know, I was creating content marketing before email and the internet. And then how did you do that? Well, what I did is I took the stuff out of my brain. I typed it up on an Atari 400 computer. I printed it out on a dot matrix printer. I cut <laughs> that and dropped it into an 11 by 17 sheet of paper and folded it over and sent it to a printer. And the printer printed it and mailed it out to my people. And that's content marketing circa 1979. So I think one of the things that a lot of people get hung up on with content is how to write the best Instagram headline and how to take the best picture and Photoshop it so you look this way. You know, it's all of the tools and the techniques when really what it boils down to is who are you speaking to and how is your content affecting them and what difference does it make, right? So exactly. Exactly. jump on that and run with it. <laughs> exactly right. It, it's again, it, com it comes back, we name those four things. Two of them I always talked about making a difference and making a profit. Today we added, make a connection and make a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about are those first three, connection, relationship, and a difference, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. if, if the only difference you're out to make is to get over a million followers and be considered an influencer, well, there may be some good things from that, but it feels sort of hollow to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I, I'm not going to name names, but I've seen people that do that. And then I've dug a little bit and I'm like, no. Um, and so with that, with that connection and that relationship that allows you to make a difference, I mean, that's, isn't that why we're here? Mm -hmm. Right. Think about the people in your life, everybody that's listening, either, you know, live or on a replay, think about the people who have made a difference in your life. Mm -hmm. Even if it was just for a moment, there was a connection, maybe the briefest of relationships or a long-term one that made a difference. Okay. What content does is allows you to do that on a regular basis. Now here's a real practical example. Okay. Those four things we keep talking about mm -hmm. um, connection, relationship, difference, and profit. And you, you used the phrase earlier, the psychology of content. Now, it's hilarious to me that the former psychologist and the content guy never put that phrase together by himself. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. How much do you want to bet that within just a very few days, there's going to be a piece of content out there called the psychology of content, connect, relationship, difference, and profit? Um, 150%. <laughs> Knowing How you, do you think it'll be a webinar? Yeah, well, it could be. How soon do you think it'll be a course? Could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it always starts off. I mean, the whole. Shh, don't tell anybody this, okay? Nobody's listening to us; they have no idea. But the reason we do these live things and talk to each other online is because it helps us spark ideas for new content. The reason I listen to Blinkist when I'm walking my dog is because I'm searching for new content. And you know what I got? I got the secret weapon right here that, <laughs> right. that has an audio recording on it. And I heard one term today and I recorded it because I forget it by the time I get home because the dog's chasing geese and pooping and eating, you know, all kinds of stuff. Fits. You forget about it, but I did went in and I actually found this one key thing. It's called Collective Collaboration. And that was by a book from a guy named, it's, um, I have to look at this. Pardon me one sec. His name is Yuval Noah Harari. 
And wow. he wrote a book called Sapiens. And then I started researching the guy. I wrote that down and that led me down this path. Actually, it was one of the lunch club things that I talked about before where I met a guy and he mentioned, oh, you've read Sapiens. Like, yeah, I did. And then, you know, I, I sent him a message in LinkedIn. What was the name of the book that you mentioned? And so I went and found it and actually found it on Blinkist and listened to it. And then it led into three more books. And it was just like, and, and all of that stuff is about what we're talking about from the deep, deep, deep level. And so collective oh, yeah. collaboration is exactly that of building that tribe. You know, what we talked about with the tools and things of that nature. So that's a, that's a very big secret you just shared here. Here's another one related to that. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a webinar or a, or a public presentation, folks, you know, those PowerPoints we do. Mm -hmm. I think they're for you. They're not for you. They're for right. So we can remember where we are. <laughs> well, yeah. And you know, what's funny is I did, um, I actually, I, I, somebody, somebody contacted me and said, okay, I want you to do some LinkedIn training. And I said, okay, you know, and I have this LinkedIn presentation done. I mean, I've done it every single year. I've done boot camps three to four times a year. I charged 99 bucks. I held it live until the pandemic. And then all of a sudden it fell off the face of the earth. As a matter of fact, the last time I did it, I was out of the hospital three days after almost dying. And I couldn't, I didn't have enough strength to stand up to do it. So I had to sit and do it, but I had it, you know, it was like, it was a no brainer. So when somebody came to me this year and said, Hey, I want you to do that. And I went, okay. I went back and rewrote the entire thing. And I rewrote it because of all the things that I'd learned over that time. And, but it was a template that I could start from. And, and I went back and created new graphics for it. And here's something I've never done before is I actually went and put speaker's notes in the template. I've never done that before. I've always done it off the top of my head because I like the free flowing nature right, right. rather than sitting there reading it. But there were so many key points. There was so much depth to it that I had to, I had to take notes. I, I couldn't just go on my memory with this. And uh, what I found was is by, you know, the combination of what I had done in the past, the free flowingness that I still offered, but having that structure built into it, it was by far the best one I've ever done. And it led me down, it's, it's still following this path of why are we doing content? What do we want out of it? You know, what's the purpose behind this? What's the purpose of being on LinkedIn? LinkedIn isn't about, um, you know, there's a lot of people that talk about their 30,000 connections, make 30,000 connections, spam all of them, you know, which is your email marketing thing, which is, we've learned, you know, you, you get 30,000 people on your list. You look at your profile and I think we could do great things together. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. So you end up with 30,000 connections, you spam them about, you know, 10% of them or 3000 of the people will actually pay attention to it and maybe open it up. You know, 10% right. open rate on email is pretty damn good. And then, yeah. then you get down to about 10% of those people or 300 people might actually have a conversation with you and 10% of them will buy. So if you spam 30,000 people, you'll sell 30 or whatever you're selling. That's not what we're talking about, is it? No, it's not. It's not, that's, that's not connection. That's, um, I call that, what's the phrase? Not, I call that pillaging your list. Yes. Okay. You're just, you're just in it for the money. And we do want to make a profit with this, but I think it, I mean, I think the, the most incredible way to do it is make a difference and a profit. And you do that with re relationship and that doesn't come you know, by spamming everybody as soon as they sign up for your for your LinkedIn, that would be like walking into, you know, a, a social event, seeing someone you didn't know that's attractive, and then putting your tongue down their mouth. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you I say as that as as possible. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Now there's some parties that that might work at, but most of the time you're going to get hurt doing that. Yeah, and you're not going to have a connection. Let me ask you something though. I've been playing with these four words. Okay. Mm -hmm. Connection and relationship, making a difference and making a profit. I like making things as simple as possible, right? I know. So connection, relationship, difference, profit. I don't like the word difference mm -hmm. for one word. And the word that comes to mind is influence. Does that make sense? Exactly. Connection, relationship, influence, profit. Um, actually, it's... Um Influence is good, but I think it's actually, instead of profit, I think it's change. I think it's more about change or Ooh, mindset. Like Connection, relationship, change, profit. I like that. Thank you. 
Yeah, because in, influence to me still speaks to the person with the 30,000 connections. That's why I was asking. It just didn't feel right. And, and because the purpose of what you and I would talk about influence, the purpose is to help people change. Right. Like um, one, of the, one of the best things Andy Stanley ever taught me, and there's been many, is the way to respond to someone who disagrees with you about something. And uh, go go down that road because that's right in line with what we were talking about before. Okay, okay. Because a lot of people think, all right, the way to change someone is to disagree with them and prove them wrong. Okay? Mm -hmm. All that does is get people to um, to dig in their heels, right? And Andy tells the story about being at some some event where they were having lunch, and a woman across from him found out he was a pastor of a church, and she just started to in on him about, yeah, you know, you, I hate all you guys and I hate all men because my, my, my husband was, you know, a, a deacon at a church and he was the worst guy and he did this and he did that. And you guys say marriage is forever. And, and who would want to be married to him? Um, she was letting out her pain, right? Um, right. In an angry way. And Andy said, well, I wouldn't want to be married to someone like that either. Totally changed the whole thing. And you hit on you hit on the key key thing. What's that? that? Empathy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. That's the key. That's the key to all of this stuff. That is the key to creating messages that make a difference. Yes. That make change is empathy. Yes. Is I hear you, I understand you, and I want to hear more from you. Ooh, that I open. hear you, I understand you, and I want to hear more. Ooh, ooh. Hear, mm -hmm. understand, hear. Right. Nice, Brian. Thank you. But that's but see, empathy is and we get back to the tribe of the 150. So let's go back to the thing that I've talked about, and we got about eight minutes left. And that was uh, we've talked about this numerous times. I've talked about it here. It's my 10 10 10 philosophy. Yes. 10 10 10 is pretty simple, okay. If you connect up with 10 people, 10 minutes, 10 words, all right? 10 people. What's the last part? 10 people, 10 minutes, 10 words. 10 words. 10 words, right. Oh, got it. Okay, so 10 people. Pick 10 people a day and connect with them. If you did that every single work day out of the month, okay, because I'm, I'm, I work on work days. I'm not going to bug people on the weekend. Everybody needs a little time off. Right. But yeah. if you did that every single month, you would connect with 200 people roughly. They're about 20 work days. And, and so, and yep. I've heard people say that the true tribe, I, 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 the guy on last week, Tim Ash, if you haven't listened to that, Jeff, and anybody else, go listen to that uh, convo that we had. Because he wrote a book, which again, you know, is going down the same path. It's called your, Unleash Your Primal Brain. And we had an awesome yeah. conversation. Um, but, um, but the 10 people, 10 minutes, 10 words. So 200 people, he said that between 100 and 200 people is your tribe. It's somewhere within that range. You know, 150 yeah. is kind of like the, you know, the, the, the pin on the, it's the pin on the um, map, you know, right. but the bottom line is you're still in the vicinity. There's suburbs around there. Um, but the key thing with it is that 10, 10 people pick 10 people a day, one minute per person. That's what the 10 minutes are for. Cause that's as long as it takes. And you, you message them where they're at. Okay. Yes. If somebody's yes. on Facebook, you go to Facebook. If somebody's on LinkedIn, you go to LinkedIn. If somebody's on, you know, Instagram, Twitter, text, smoke signals, it doesn't matter. You do it, whatever it is, you know, that person because you've had a conversation with them. You have a relationship, you send them something and you say, how are you doing? Number one. And how can I help you? That's it. And what you do is you basically say, how are you doing? Show some empathy. How can I help you? And, and you don't necessarily say it exactly that way. But if I was to go to you, Jeff, I'd say, hey, Jeff, man, what's happening? Um, I've got an idea. That to you. <laughs> I yeah. know it's going to help you because like these conversations, we have these yeah. great sparking. You know, basically, I call it spark sparring. You know, you throw out an idea. I throw out an idea. By the time we're done, we both go, whoa, dude, <laughs> that was awesome. Um, so that 10 minutes and that 10 people, what you're doing is you're basically nurturing those relationships. And the thing about with the people that you pick, I have, I have over 1,500 people in my CRM, all right? I have gone in and, and hit a button that says favorite 200 people. 
And when somebody responds to me, they stay in the favorite. And if I do this a couple of times and people don't respond to me, they get unfavorited and I replace them with somebody right. else, right. you know, because they're responsive at the time. Doesn't mean they can't come back. But the bottom line is, is that you're picking those people. Now, those are people that I want to stay in touch with because I can help them. Those are people that might refer me to somebody. They're not necessarily people I do business with. They're just anybody. It could be somebody I might do business with in the future. Maybe somebody that can, you know, I can learn from like you, you know, or, or, you know, those are the things I'm looking at is how do they fit into my tribe? And I'm really thinking through that in one way, shape or form. So when you get down to it, how do we create content with empathy that makes those people want to stick around in our tribe? I love that. Can I give you a, a non-business example? Please. And that's exactly what I'm looking for because business doesn't necessarily have to do anything with this. It's about yeah, people. Yeah, it works all, all along. We have something at um, at our church called Inside Out. That's mm -hmm. the name of the, the high school ministry, right? Right. Now, it's a little bit out of proportion. We get about a thousand kids every Sunday. It's, mm -hmm. it's big. And I'm a small group leader. And so, you know, there's a whole lot of small group leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you need to put an E in I know. It's just, I just noticed that. I'm editing it. Go ahead, my friend. Keep going. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, and so there's a lot of small group leaders. Okay. And and I'm 63, white hair, white goatee. You know, um, I'm not the youngest looking person there. Right. And so other people ask me, how can an old guy be the most popular small group leader? You know, because you talk to people that aren't in your group all the time. Well, that's one clue. Um, but during the week, um, Brian, I'm doing what you just said. Now, Facebook is out for, you know, high school kids. But um, um, Instagram, Text. um, texting, talk, <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm checking in with people. You know, and if you look, if you go and look at the people that have liked most of my Instagrams, three fourths of them are those kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what, well, what's the point of that? Okay. Do you think I have some influence there? Yeah. Do you think I have some lifelong friends? You know, um, it's so funny. <laughs> Caleb, my, he's in this group. He's a senior there too. And he was looking at me the other day. He goes, how, 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 what? He goes, dad, all these, remember when we graduated, there was like one big party, right? Right. These kids, these kids having their own graduation party and everybody comes, right? I mean, we're going to take this through the summer. Um, but he goes, dad, I go to these things where I'm invited and you're invited too. We're, and we came up with the title of old guy, most invited to graduation. <laughs> 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 and what you're talking about is why it's the empathy and it's the connection and, and what, how long does this take me? It's usually done at night when I'm watching, you know, a ball game or, or, or binging on something. Or replays of Cagney and Lacey. What's that? Replays of Cagney and Lacey. That, well, yeah, more like MASH and Hill Street Blues. And, right, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and Blue Bloods. But, yeah, I, I get the point. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I, you know, that's so what we've really kind of just to wrap this thing up because we got about two minutes before we finish up. So um, the the concept of what we're talking about is, you know, we've gone through a lot, but the key thing is is communicating with the people that you can make a difference with and get them to change through empathy and creating content that eventually leads them down that journey that shows them who you are and makes them feel like they can know, like, and trust you getting to a point where they want to pay attention to you. And then eventually if you help them make that change, then you can figure out a way to profit from it. And when we say profit, we're not just talking cash people. We're talking about introducing you to somebody we're talking Absolutely. about, you know, I'll give you one last quick story on this and, and we're, we're there and we got to jump. So I'm going to put up your banner here. All right. So that people, if you want to connect with, um, Jeff, do this. But the last story is I had a, a guy in one of my masterminds who said to me, Brian, your bacon uh, podcast would be perfect for a radio station I'm working on right now in Nashville, North Carolina. I said to myself, you know, this is a podcast. It's like, what am I going to do? You know, I don't have a half hour of content. I got 10 minutes. So we had this conversation and the lady, the uh, place said, I could fit you in, you know, it's seven o'clock in the morning. I've got 10 minute slot where I'm just playing classical music. I'll drop you in and do this. Well, that was perfect. Okay. Yeah. I'm not making any money on this at all. So now I'm on a radio station in Asheville, North Carolina. 
Another client comes back to me and says, hey, I want you to help me get on radio shows. He wrote a book. And so I ended up calling up the lady and saying, hey, you know, um, I got a guy who's got a book and I know you have a radio station. You have anybody who would work in this genre? And she says, oh, hell yeah. Not only do I have one on my station, but I know a whole bunch of others on other small stations all over there the United go. States. And by the, way, and by the way, the reason is because I listen to your podcast every single morning and you have such great stuff. I know I can trust you. I've never met the woman in person. But now she is turning one of my clients into a rock star on the radio because of something that I took my content and repurposed. So wow. I love yeah. it. And that's that that's essentially what it boils down to. There was nothing in that that I was gonna make money on. It was right. all about building a relationship and taking it to the next level. Yep. So any parting well, words from Don Pardo, better known as uh, Jeff Herring? Anything you want to say before well, we finish up? Wow, you're dating us now. Yeah, so, I know. <laughs> I knew what you were talking about. Um Four, four words, okay? Mm -hmm. Connection, relationship, change, and profit. Yep. Re connection, relationship, change, and profit. You remember those and do those every day with your content, you're going to be really gratified at the influence and change you make. And I think you'll be happy with the kind of lifestyle you can create too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, brother, it was a blast. Thank you for coming on. I yeah, so greatly yeah. appreciate it's you awesome. and your time. It's always fun, you know. And the thing is, we always go down these pikes, you know, this this different stuff that we never know specifically where we're going to go, but it always is so entertaining. You know what's funny? I, I made I made three notes, one, two, three, about what to talk about on this. Mm -hmm. And we didn't do any of them, but I have three pages of notes. After <laughs> it's a beautiful thing, man. Yeah, All right, I'm gonna roll this out with some uh bacon and coffee theme music. Everybody, thank you so much for coming. We will see you next week. I have a great guest next week. You want to learn about PR? This is the man. He is one of the by far one of the best people I've ever seen. He does just amazing things. So come check it out. We'll see you next week, guys. Hey.